I'm talking about uh, applications of robotics and lateral spine surgery. And here are my, uh, oops, I guess my disclosures are um, listed. So, uh, and I, uh, this is a slide I present quite a bit. It's entitled Robots, What Should They Do? Because I, I think everybody's perception can, can differ. You know, I, I would typically think of a robot, you know, from movies and, and from other um, uh, fields as a device or machine that can perform a task autonomously, repetitively, you know, efficiently. You, you see it the same way. It's always done uh, appropriately. But when it comes to spy, uh, spinal robot, that's really not uh, the case. It's not an autonomous device. It's actually um, a really a, a machine that originally impacted only a small portion of your procedure, and that was screw placement. So uh, it, uh, people have used the term COBOL, which I think is more apt, uh, because it's a device that really just assists a surgeon uh, to, to do a portion of the procedure. And it, it, it does act like a robot because it, it produces consistency, uh, I think. And with consistency, you get time efficiency, and potentially, if it's, uh, it improves your accuracy, uh, safety. So, you know, uh, the original iterations of robots were optimized for pedicle screw placement, particularly percutaneous and cortical screw trajectory. You can use a robot for open cases, but really can be mitigated by your incision size because you tend to plan uh, a screw uh, with a, a medial trajectory. And sometimes with an open incision, you just can't get that trajectory using a robot. So really optimized for percutaneous uh, MIS procedures. Uh, newer iterations of robot, and that's what I'm going to touch upon. And so you're going to see this gradual evolution of robotic technology, which I think you see with any enabling technology. It tends to evolve or improve over time. And so I, I'm going to show how it's going to impact every, uh, pretty much every aspect of the procedure, not just the screw placement. So you can see where the evolution is coming from. So I, I just want to sort of give you a little bit of the history of it. So I, I think it's always important to look at the literature when you're talking about a uh, new technique or device and see what, what's out there scientifically because you want an objective representation. And so if you look at this literature review, it's relatively recent, it was published in uh, 2018. I think there's um, uh, been quite a bit uh, or quite a number of uh, newer studies, but they're all very similar. Uh, they tend to look at um, uh, several endpoints uh, such as accuracy or most consistently, also, uh, uh, radiation exposure. Um, some of the studies look at uh, operative efficiency and length of stay, but really the focus on most of these studies is screw accuracy and radiation exposure. And ag again, that's because most of the robots were initially designed just for screw placement. And I I'll just summarize, uh, accuracy is very high. Uh, it's what you would expect. You, you buy a million dollar machine, it's got to give you some accuracy, right? Um, when it comes to radiation exposure, you, you would think the studies would be consistent in, in the sense that uh, there's decreased radiation with the use of the robot, but uh, that's actually not true. If you actually closely look at the studies, now uh, there are only about 13 studies when this literature review was performed. Uh, the, uh, it was mixed, and, and the reason why is if you look at the studies closely, uh, the surgeons who were using the robot weren't, weren't comfortable with it. They, they weren't sure, so they would get a fluoroscopic image using a robot, pretty much like you would do with an open case. And so the, the statistically significance didn't, uh, uh, didn't, it wasn't achieved. But in the cases where the surgeons were comfortable with the robot and used it like it should be, there was radiation uh, decrease uh, in terms of exposure. And that's what you would expect, and that's been my experience, and particularly for milling invasive cases. So I think that's a, a definite potential uh, benefit of the robot. So now moving on to what you get with a robot-assisted lateral. Well, early applications were really percutaneous pedicle screw placement only. And you could place them either in the single position lateral or the traditional two-stage approach where you do the lateral and the reposition prone for the screw placements. Um, the biggest impact, if you ask me with a robot, is uh, with single position lateral uh, because it can be a challenge with fluoroscopic-based uh, uh, placement. If you haven't done it before, using a fluoroscope in a lateral position to place screws there, there's very uh, much a, a, a learning curve issue with that. And it can prolong operative time. It can make a fluoroscopic exposure in terms of how much you get um, really um, uh, quite high. So uh, again, looking at the literature, there was only really one study looking at it by Huntsman and he used a robot uh, in the single position lateral uh, to place screws. Uh, it wasn't uh, used for the the actual lateral lumbar antibody fusion, but just the, the screw placement. You can see, um, yeah, here's a picture from that study where he's placing the, uh, the robotically assisted screws. 
it's simply doable. And he did it on 55 patients with uh, several hundred screw placements. If you look at it, uh, it was fairly accurate. Uh, they didn't use CT-based criteria, but he just used x-rays and clinical symptoms. And uh, he reported 98% accuracy again, but it was not CT-based. No complications noted. There was just one other study looking at robotic-assisted uh, laterals. And this was a two-stage uh, uh, operation where uh, the lateral was performed and the patient was reposition prone. It was a randomized study uh, with a comparison group uh, being freehand. And they had 40 in each group. And you can see this is uh, order generation of robot where they see these K wires. Uh, nowadays, robots don't, don't need K wires. And uh, if you just look at the data, um, uh, accuracy was much higher with robotic assisted screw placement uh, versus freehand, uh, but this was reposition prone. And there was increased operative efficiency. Uh, screw placement was much quicker with the robot, and that's where uh, the operative efficiency was found. So this was uh, really the literature when it comes to robotic assisted laterals. Um, again, improved operative efficiency just on the screw placement. So I'll, I'll use a couple of case examples to, to show where we were at about a year ago and where we're at now. And you can see there, there's been an evolution of uh, uh, robotic application to laterals. So this is a patient of mine, 66 year old woman with back and leg pain. That's something you see all the time, spondy high grade stenosis, okay? Refractory to conservative management. I'm a big fan of uh, indirect decompression for this uh, with uh, percutaneous screw placement. And so that was what was done here. And I'm gonna show you uh, how I was doing it about a year ago. Um, so I'm a big fan of navigation in general. I've been using navigation for laterals for probably about five years now. Um, it, it, as long as you pay attention to the details, it, it's accurate. And I don't really wear lead uh, during surgery. So usually the first time you get a picture for a standard case is after the cage is in. So for, from skin incision or skin marking all the way to cage placement, I'm not wearing lead, I'm not using fluoroscopy. Um, so I, I think it works. I've done it on uh, now um, over 100 patients, and it's worked quite well. And so you, you need to secure the patient securely. And I just I use a regular uh, flat Jackson table. So I'm not using a regular wire table uh, and breaking it. I just put a roll underneath the patient, but there's, uh, they're secured with a heavy amount of tape so they don't shift. And um, so the workflow for me before, with the first iteration of the robot, was to do the navigated lateral first. So you can see here, uh, uh, I'm doing the procedure here. You can see the reference frame. This is an oblique approach uh, to L45. And there's a navigation pointer within the disk space. As you can see here, uh, I'm doing sort of an anterior source approach. And I anchor the, uh, the navigated dialer, and this is stimulatable into the disk space, and I just sequentially dilate after that. And then retract your place and pretty straightforward. I, I don't use fluoroscopy. I've gotten to the point where I'm very comfortable with it. I look at the anatomy, if it seems to fit, and it correlates. I, I don't typically get a fluoroscopic image here. And so, um, now I'm just putting the K trials in. Again, no fluoroscopy, I'm not wearing lead. And that follows with the uh, cage placement. Now, before um, I would transition to using a robot. So with a robot, I need uh, to acquire an image. And this is uh, uh, not a similar system to the first navigation system. So I have to reacquire the image here. And this is uh, 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 the method of doing that. And I can show you in the lab. And I'm gonna plant the screws here, and you can see uh, with the red arrow here, the cage has already been placed you know, with a navigated uh, um, um, system, the navigation system. And now the, the screw placement is relatively straightforward. Here's our chief resident doing it. I'm not doing anything. That's the nice thing about the robot. You know, in the lateral position, there actually is a fair amount of manual dexterity uh, required. You're looking at the fluoroscopic image in the lateral position. You have, to, you have to have your arm in a certain position to traverse the pedicle. It's a little bit more challenging in the prone position. But with a robotic arm, it's a, remember, it's a rigid sort of guide. You don't have to do anything. It holds it uh, in place, and all you're doing is drilling a screw track followed by a pedicle screw, connected to a screw extender. It's really straightforward. Anyone can do it. Chief President's doing it. I'm not touching the patient at this point. Uh, and uh, it works quite well. And this is after screws are placed, we're uh, inserting the rods here. And I do uh, turn the patient over, makes uh, or tilt the patient over because it makes a rod placement pretty easy. And here are the... Um, x-rays afterwards, you can see the cage was placed nicely and the uh, screws were look accurate. So what do we do now? Well, I, I think, uh, as I say, uh, enabling technologies will evolve over time. And there uh, uh, has been um, an, a sort of an update on the current robotic platform that we have. And remember, robotic platform is built on navigation. So it, it essentially is uh, a navigation system. And that's where uh, the evolution has come from. 
And this is how it's going to impact every aspect of the lateral procedure. So, um, so what do you get out of that? Uh, this new system is the ability to cage plan. So I could pre-plan where I want my cage. And that allows, um, I think, an optimized uh, cage position. Because sometimes when you're doing a fluoroscopic base, the cage kind of settles wherever I, I think you've done your work, right? But if you use navigation pre-plan where your uh, cage is going to go to, if you want to uh, uh, place a little bit more posteriorly to get uh, indirect uh, decompression, you can do that. If you want a little bit more anterior for segmental lordosis, you can do that. So cage planning is a big thing that uh, the robot system now allows. So you can pre-plan where your cage is going to be placed. You could also um, do every aspect of the procedure utilizing robotic uh, assisted navigation. That's retractor placement, again, uh, that would de minimize or decrease your fluoroscopic usage. And all the instrumentation for the, this prep is navigated uh, in addition to the uh, cage placement. And I'm going to show you that. So this is um, sort of uh, the workflow in a, in a cadaver. So we practice on a cadaver first before going to the patient. You can see the first step is robotic assisted percutaneous screw placement with screw extenders. Afterwards, we'll, we'll, we'll go to uh, placing uh, the retractor utilizing the navigation uh, aspect of the robot. And then all the instruments are navigated, cage gets placed and the rod is uh, then finally positioned. And this is just a, a view of the cage planning. Now I could position a cage, I could look at the size, you know, 18 millimeter, 22 millimeter wide cage, and you could plan where you want it into this space. You could select the size. Um, and these are typically expandable cages so you could, uh, with adjustable lordosis. So you could, um, you're gonna have to fluoroscopically view those when, when it comes to cage expansion, but you could position the cage where you want to. So this, uh, this cage planning, um, I think could optimize and, uh, and make you more consistent with where you put the cage. So it's an added benefit. And this is just on a cadaver, a uh, place in the cage according to your plan. And so I have a second case example now. I show you the first one where it was navigation assisted lateral followed by robot assisted percutaneous screw placement. Now this cage, uh, this particular case will be all robot assisted uh, cage placement as well as uh, percutaneous screw placement. 66 year old woman, back and leg pain, sort of similar to last patient, spondy at four or five uh, with uh, stenosis. And here are her standing x-rays. You can see uh, Spondy's mobile. And I chose to treat it uh, with a single position lateral. Here's the position. Again, heavy amount of taping. You don't want this ship because I'm doing everything navigation-based. And I don't really use fluoroscopy. And here, here's a, so there's a little bit of video. And I, I apologize. It's sort of a wide field of view, but you can see every step here. So first step, and here we're just planning where the iliac pin is going to go. And it's important you put the pin in a, a correct position because you don't want it to be in the way of your screw placement or your retractor. So that ends up being in a superior portion of that crest. Um, if you don't place it properly, it's just going to get in your way. And so uh, I showed you where we're going to place it. And then once a the pin is placed, we're going to acquire the image, so intraoperative image acquisition. And you can see here, we've acquired the image. Now I'm going to go to, uh, I, this is sped up, obviously. I don't move that fast. And I'm, I'm just planning the screws. And then once the screws are planned, our, our resident's going to put the screws in. I don't really do much. I just let them do it because, again, it holds arm rigid. And uh, it's, it's basically anyone can do it. You don't need much manual dexterity to put the, uh, put the screws in. Because those are the, the dots are where the screw, plan, uh, screw plans would uh, suggest we make the skin incisions. So he's just putting the screws in. You know, I'm off to the side just watching him. So essentially, it's a, we're going to drill a screw track and follow with the screw. So it, it doesn't take very many steps. And, you know, we're going a little bit slow here um, just because he, um, our resident, uh, a great resident, this is one of his like first robotic cases. So, uh, but usually it can be pretty straightforward uh, in terms of like screw placement. And then once the screws are placed, we're going to move on to the uh, retractor placement. So you're going to see, I'm going to use a navigated pointer to select uh, this skin incision site. As you can see here in the picture, none of us are wearing lead. And there's no fluoroscope in the screen, actually. It, we haven't used fluoroscopy at all. And so everything is based on navigation here. And, yet, and I've got to that point where I'm comfortable doing it. But the caveat is, if navigation is off, it could create a nightmare scenario. So you're not sure, just, get, just take a fluoroscopic image. Uh, but if everything looks straightforward to me, I, I, I've been not using fluoroscopy here. And you can see where we're, we're going to make the skin incision based on navigation. And again, I apologize uh, for a wide field of view. 
So this is the retractor arm. We're just having it set up. And you can see that we're going to use the, this uh, multifunction instrument, which is a dilator nerve stimulator as well as has a tracking frame on it uh, to guide us into the uh, across the uh, soft muscle to this space. And that, this is the instrument here. So we've made a skin incision and split the abdominal musculature. Now we're going to traverse the retroperitoneal space just using uh, this navigated dilator. So again, you don't see a fluoroscope in the field of view because we're not using fluoroscopy. And uh, again, with navigation, you can take a slightly oblique trajectory if you need to, if the iliac crest is in a way. Again, uh, I have another video with the with a, a, a more coned in view, but just with time constraints, I, I just wanted to show you the workflow. As you can see here, um, after retractor's place, we're gonna check placement with the, the navigator pointer. And then all the instruments are navigated. At this point, this prep is very straightforward. So if you get any experience in lateral procedures, you could look in and tell you're at the disc level and you could kind of kind of confirm that grossly, that navigation is correct. And with all this uh, disc prep uh, being navigated, the curettes, the raspers, the trials, uh, you know, it's relatively straightforward. It's just a discectomy at this point. And once you've created this space, uh, I'm gonna put a navigated trial end and an expandable cage. And uh, like I said, I, I could, if anyone's interested here, at least I could show you another video with a more cone in view of how, how the navigated uh, uh, instruments are being used. And this is, uh, I believe the cage going in now. So I just made sure that the cage looks like where it should be. So I'm visually checking it. And then once the cage is in, we're expanding. That's the expansion uh, mechanism, just turning it off. And uh, we're pulse uh, filling the cage with some graft. And then, uh, you, know, you know, rod placement is pretty straightforward, so I'll move on. As you can see, the whole case was done without fluoroscopy. You didn't see a fluoroscope in the whole field of view. So we get a fluoroscopic image after the procedure, or after the cage is placed, and I get it for rod placement, just make sure rods are seen through screw heads. But here's a pre and post op. See, completely robotic assisted navigated procedure. So um, in, in summary, I think spinal robots are, are not autonomous right now. Maybe we'll get to that point in the future. Um, it was initially, uh, robots were initially optimized for screw placement, but now with the expansion of navigation capability with a robotic platform, it's going to evolve into being able to be used in every aspect of the procedure. And I really do think that that will decrease the barrier to, be, to adopting some of these uh, advanced lateral procedures. Like uh, I've recently gone to prone laterals and um, I was more comfortable doing it because I was using navigation. You know, the first prone lateral I did was using navigation. It gave me a little bit more faith that I, I was in the correct location and I was doing what I thought was appropriate. So I, I think that's the definition of an enabling technology that allows you to proceed for, uh, forward uh, with uh, a little bit more confidence. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Paul. So... Um, we're gonna keep moving, Paul. Um, Dr. Hayes is way behind. So um, thank you, Paul. Uh, we maybe go to questions and after Dr. Hayes. Dr. Hayes is gonna talk about his uh, pitfalls when doing anterior access to the spine. As you guys know, Dr. Hayes is, you know, badass vascular surgeon. <laughs> he does the approaches for every spine like nothing, you know, make us look really bad. So Dr. Hay, thank you for, for sharing your uh, experience with us today. My pleasure. Can we My pull pleasure. up the imaging? Okay, so Paul, while we have set up for Dr. Hayes, um, I'm gonna ask you a question, Paul. So what is your plan B? How do you know the navigation is getting off? Like, like I said, I've, I've come to this point where I'm, I'm pretty comfortable. I'm always visually looking. So if you have any uh, experience with navigation, you can look down and see the annulus of this space, concavity of this. So I'm putting the pointer down and making sure that it seems to fit. Now, navigation doesn't have to be perfect for lateral, unlike screw placement. You could be off a couple of millimeters here and there. But as long as it's grossly accurate, you know, depending on trajectory views and my own experience, 
you know, doing laterals to confirm it's accurate. But if there's any question, you should have a fluoroscope in the field and take a few fluoroscopic spot images to make sure it's accurate. But that'll still be a marked decrease in the amount of fluoroscopic uh, imaging you have to do. And, and your flow is first screws, then lateral. So, uh, Paul, Paul, can I ask you a question? Sorry, Paul, can I ask you a question? I, I, in doing now, I mean, as you said, the, the prone lateral lends itself, well, I think Juan mentioned it, to just to navigation and also robotics. I mean, it, it's just so much better. I mean, I, I haven't used the fluoroscopy in a long time. Why, why, I have two questions. One, I've been using the robot to put the lateral dilator in. So I'll use it to put the first dilator into the disc space so that I can choose the mid portion of the disc to try to get away from any you know, issues. So uh, I, I do that, but I have a little bit of a hard time with the placement of the cage. Um, that, that seems to be the biggest issue with robotic and navigation for me when I do it. Um, you have a, a you, and then I do a spin at the end rather than a fluoro. So I never have to get the fluoro machine out at all. Yeah, so um, navigation uh, is helpful, but it, it doesn't, um, so there's a couple um, um, ways I think your case can be off, even, even with using navigation. If you don't do a good discectomy, despite what navigation shows you, the cage will go to path of least resistance. So if you do a poor discectomy, say um, anteriorly, for example, and you leave a lot of disc, even though you're trying to push the cage forward and navigation shows you you're, you're being pushed forward, it's not gonna go there because there's too much resistance. So, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's absolutely, uh, Bill, what uh, uh, Paul said. The other thing is navigation is also the case that fits perfect navigation in the expandable cage because you start very small and you expand it at the end plate let you go. So uh, you go with a static cage on the navigation. I mean, you have to be a very experienced spine so you knowing that you started with a collapsed space and your height is gonna be eight or 10 millimeters or 12. But if you go with expandable and you start, let's say six height, you just go, you know, what the resistance give you. I think that's the way out for the placement of the cages on the navigation. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's, a, that's it, exactly the problem that I face too, is that is mm -hmm. that getting the right size, putting it in there without the fluoroscopy is, I, I haven't found another way to do it besides using an expandable cage. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and the other thing oh. is I, I, for example, you know, I'm so much, uh, you know, I don't believe not even on my mother. I always keep, I, I call Sentinel. I always keep the floor on the AP view on prone lateral as a Sentinel image. So when I put in the cage, I get one or two shots, you know, it doesn't hurt too much. Yeah, Neil? Well, it's Neil. I mean, that was really elegant presentation, Paul. I've, I've had two issues have come up with. One, let's say you're doing multiple levels. You're going to the second or third level. What happens then with your navigation because that moves? The second question was the end plate. How do you make sure you haven't violated the end plate? That's the one that really bothers me. Yeah, those are actually two very good questions. That, uh, I actually have another talk that would address those. Okay. Uh, but uh, multiple levels is not a big deal because like I said, I've been using navigation for, for about five years now and I've done four levels with one spin. Uh, so the pin is an inlet crest. So I start at, if I'm doing L1, L5, for example, I'll start at one, two. Now migrate closer to the pin. I think that lessens your error rate. But by the time I get a third or fourth inner body, I'm probably off two or three millimeters, but that's okay. Because I'm not, you know, it, you don't need sub millimeter accuracy. We're not putting a screw in. I'm trying to find where the disc is. Um, and then your end plate issue, I, I think it's a matter of having experience. I mean, even with a fluoroscope, you people violate end plates all the time, right? <laughs> you know, a, a navigation will give you trajectory. So, you know, you want to be orthogonal to the disk space. So it's very helpful. You know, even if it's off two or three millimeters, generally the angulation or trajectory is pretty, pretty parallel to that, right? So navigation is just frame shifting if you have an error. So your trajectories are reasonable. So I, you know, it helps me be orthogonal to this space. So you're less likely to violate the end plate. You violate the end plates because you're not orthogonal. You're like coming into this space at the, or the end plate at an angle with your instrument. So it, in fact, if you put the pointer down repeatedly and you know what they're, you know, what where it is orthogonal perpendicular to this space, I think you lessen the li uh, the likelihood of doing that. And, and, and that's a great commentary, Neil, because. Um, 
Uh, once you do the first level, actually you go in doing the end plate by feeling more than anything. So that one only gives you experience doing the approach. So I can imagine first person doing multi-level navigation. If he doesn't have a good experience on lateral, he will ruin all the end plates. Um, and the other one is um, uh, that does have lack of technology from our side. You know, I, I'm, I'm always praying what is going to be the first company that will give an update with one single shot after the first level, feed the computer and uh, adjust the navigation, you know, once you open it up. I think it's a matter of companies put money on the, on the, on the field and develop because I, I mean, that's, I, I, to be honest, I think for a good sort one engineer, that's not a big complicated problem. The problem is, is what is the return on navigation to the implant companies? Very little. It's a capital buy. Hospitals don't want to pay for it. It's a couple of hundred thousand dollars. And it's different than a screw on a case that you use one per case and three, four, 10, 20. So uh, there is not too much incentive on the economical point of view. You see nowadays all these navigation systems are placed pretty much for free on the hospital, just like a, an agreement of users or something. So, so the motivation, I believe that is not as high as producing more lucrative, unfortunately, but that's the, the reality. What do you think, Neil? No, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I agree with you. I think Sorry. obviously we all got the experience and I, and I think that's all I'm asking, but it's doable. I do believe it's doable. You just gotta cross these small barriers. Yeah. Uh, you you want to say something? Um, um, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, th thanks, Juan, and uh, thanks, Paul. Great talk. I, 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 with that bird, man. You look like a... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did it to scare you all. But, um, Paul, I, I, I wanted to ask you, you know, that there's a lot of different options that are coming onto the field now. There's augmented reality and robotics and navigation and so on. And, and you know, like one said, there's limited funding. You know, what, what, obviously the technological part of the puzzle needs to follow these new techniques and these new procedures that we're developing. But what is what here? Uh, you know, if, if I'm the decision maker in terms of adopting new technology for my institution, um, do I, you know, do I just kind of stick with ORM navigation or something that, that we're used to, that we use for screws and so on. Can you kind of just give us your viewpoint? Listen, you know, man, you know how it is, the hospital systems and that. Yeah. Whatever yeah. you spend less money, that's the system that they would like it. You know, we, we're in a tight budget and it is not easy. You know, all of us, we like to have the best toys available, but um, we have to understand that uh, the, the real life is different and um, they will go for the less resistant pathway. And the problem is this one. Let's say you, you work in a hospital where it's on a health system with 30 spine surgeons and out of the 30, you have 20 that they are all fashioned, everything open, floral, freehand, and 10 of them asking for this technology. The 20 others, they will kill your innovation you know and then you have to wait until they retire maybe a new generation it's tough you know um yeah. it's different and paul park works in a very advanced institution that is pro on you know um, innovation neil has a cr sinai that is like a tip of the arrow on their area you know but otherwise not all the systems are that friendly about that. 